Chapter Ten of Famous Men of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. L i b r i v o x dot org. Chapter Ten of Famous Men of the Middle Ages by John H. Harden and A. B. Poland, Charles Martel, seven fourteen to seven forty one A.D. And Pepin, seven forty one to seven sixty eight A.D. Part one. After the death of Mohammed, the Saracens, as Mohammedans are also called, became great warriors. They conquered many countries and established the Mohammedan religion in them. In seven eleven, the Saracens invaded and conquered a great part of Spain. And founded a powerful kingdom there, which lasted about seven hundred years. They intended to conquer the land of the Franks next, and then all Europe. They thought it would be easy to conquer the Franks, because the Frankish king at that time was a very weak man. He was one of a number of kings who were called the Do Nothings. They reigned from about six hundred and thirty-eight to seven hundred and fifty-one. They spent all their time in amusements and pleasures, leaving the affairs of the government to be managed by persons called mayors of the palace. The mayors of the palace were officers, who at first managed the king's household. Afterwards, they were made guardians of kings who came to the throne when very young. As long as the king was under age, the mayor of the palace acted as chief officer of the government in his name. And as several of the young kings, even when they were old enough to rule, gave less attention to business than to pleasure, the mayors continued to do all the business, until at last they did everything the the king ought to have done. They made war, led armies in battle, raised money and spent it, and carried on the government as they pleased without consulting the kings. The do nothings had the title of king, but nothing more. In fact, they did not desire to have any business to do. The things they cared for were dogs, horses, and sport. The most famous of the mayors was a man called Pepin. Once a year, it is said, Pepin had the king dressed in his finest clothes and paraded through the city of Paris, where the court was held. A splendid throng of nobles and courtiers accompanied the king. And did him honour as he went along the streets in a gilded chariot drawn by a long line of beautiful horses. The king was cheered by the people, and he acknowledged their greetings most graciously. After the parade, the king was escorted to the great hall of the palace, which was filled with nobles. Seated on a magnificent throne, he saluted the assemblage and made a short speech. The speech was prepared beforehand by Pepin, and committed to memory by the king. At the close of the ceremony, the royal nobody retired to his country house and was not heard of again for a year. Part two. Pepin died in seven fourteen A.D., and his son Charles, who was twenty-five years old at that time, succeeded him as mayor of the palace. This Charles is known in history as Charles Martel. He was a brave young man. He had fought in many of his father's battles, and so had become a skilled soldier. His men were devoted to him. While he was mayor of the palace, he led armies in several wars against the enemies of the Franks. The most important of his wars was won with the Saracens, who came across the Pyrenees from Spain and invaded the land of the Franks, intending to establish Mohammedanism there. Their army was led by Abd er Rahman, the Saracen governor of Spain. On his march through the southern districts of the land of the Franks, Abd er Rahman destroyed many towns and villages, killed a number of the people, and seized all the property he could carry off. He plundered the city of Bordeaux, and it is said obtained so many valuable things that every soldier. Was loaded with golden vases and cups and emeralds and other precious stones, but meanwhile Charles Martel was not idle. As quickly as he could, he got together a great army of Franks and Germans and marched against the Saracens. The two armies met between the city of Tours and Poitiers 
in October 732. For six days there was nothing but an occasional skirmish between small parties from both sides, but on the seventh day a great battle took place. Both Christians and Mohammedans fought with terrible earnestness. The fight went on all day, and the field was covered with the bodies of the slain. But toward evening, during a resolute charge made by the Franks, Abd er Rahman was killed. Then the Saracens gradually retired to their camp. It was not yet known, however, which side had won, and the Franks expected that the fight would be renewed in the morning. But when Charles Martel, with his Christian warriors, appeared on the field at sunrise, there was no enemy to fight. The Mohammedans had fled in the silence and darkness of the night, and had left behind them all their valuable spoils. There was now no doubt which side had won. The Battle of Tours, or Poitiers, as it should be called, is regarded as one of the decisive battles of the world. It decided that Christians, and not Muslims, should be the ruling power in Europe. Charles Martel is especially celebrated as the hero of this battle. It is said that the name Martel was given to him because of his bravery during the fight. Marteau is the French word for hammer, and one of the old French historians says that as a hammer breaks and crushes iron and steel, so Charles broke and crushed the power of his enemies in the Battle of Tours. But though the Saracens fled from the battlefield of Tours, they did not leave the land of the Franks, and Charles had to fight other battles with them before they were finally defeated. At last, however, he drove them across the Pyrenees, and they never again attempted to invade Frankland. After his defeat of the Saracens, Charles Martel was looked upon as the great champion of Christianity, and to the day of his death, in 741, he was, in reality, though not in name, the King of the Franks. Part 3 Charles Martel had two sons, Pépin and Carloman. For a time they ruled together, but Carloman wished to lead a religious life, so he went to a monastery and became a monk. Then Pépin was sole ruler. Pépin was quite low in stature, and therefore was called Pépin the Short, but he had great strength and courage. A story is told of him which shows how fearless he was. One day he went with a few of his nobles to a circus to see a fight between a lion and a bull. Soon after the fight began, it looked as though the bull were getting the worst of it. Pépin cried out to his companions, Will one of you separate the beasts? But there was no answer. None of them had the courage to make the attempt. Then Pépin jumped from his seat, rushed into the arena, and with a thrust of his sword killed the lion. In the early years of Pépin's rule as mayor of the palace, the throne was occupied by a king named Hilderic III. Like his father and other do-nothing kings, Hilderic cared more for pleasures and amusements than for affairs of government. Pépin was the real ruler, and after a while he began to think that he ought to have the title of king, as he had all the power and did all the work of governing and defending the kingdom. So he sent some friends to Rome to consult the Pope. They said to his holiness, Holy Father, who ought to be the king of France, the man who has the title, or the man who has the power and does all the duties of the king? Certainly, replied the Pope, the man who has the power and does the duties. Then surely, said they, Pépin ought to be the king of the Franks, for he has all the power. The Pope gave his consent, and Pépin was crowned king of the Franks, and thus the reign of Hilderic ended, and that of Pépin began. During nearly his whole reign, Pépin was engaged in war. Several times he went to Italy to defend the Pope against the Lombards. These people occupied certain parts of Italy, including the province still called Lombardy. Pépin conquered them and gave as a present to the Pope that part of their processions which extended for some distance around Rome. This was called Pépin's donation. It was the beginning of what is known as the temporal power of the Popes, that is, their power as rulers a part of Italy. 
Pepin died in 768. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Famous Men of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Men of the Middle Ages by John H. Horan and A. B. Poland. Chapter Eleven Charlemagne, King from 768 to 814 A.D. Part One. Pepin had two sons, Charles and Carloman. After the death of their father, they ruled together, but in a few years Carloman died, and then Charles became sole king. This Charles was the most famous of the kings of the Franks. He did so many great and wonderful things that he is called Charlemagne, which means Charles the Great. He was a great soldier. For thirty years he carried on a war against the Saxons, Finally he conquered them, and their great chief, Wittekin, submitted to him. The Saxons were a people of Germany, who then lived near the land of the Franks. They spoke the same language, and were of the same race as the Franks, but had not been civilized by contact with the Romans. They were still pagans, just as the Franks had been before Clovis became a Christian. They actually offered human sacrifices. After Charlemagne conquered them, he made their lands part of his kingdom. A great number of them, among whom was Wittekind, then became Christians and were baptized, and soon they had churches and schools in many parts of their country. Another of Charlemagne's wars was against the Lombards. Pepin, as you have read, had defeated the Lombards and given to the Pope part of the country held by them. The Lombard king now invaded the Pope's lands, and threatened Rome itself, so the Pope sent to Charlemagne for help. Charlemagne quickly marched across the Alps, and attacked the Lombards. He drove them out of the Pope's lands, and took possession of their country. After he had conquered the Lombards, he carried on war, in 778, in Spain. A large portion of Spain was then held by the Moorish Saracens, but a Mohammedan leader from Damascus had invaded their country, and the Moors invited Charlemagne to help them. He therefore led an army across the Pyrenees. He succeeded in putting his Moorish friends in possession of their lands in Spain, and then set out on his return to his own country. On the march his army was divided into two parts. The main body was led by Charlemagne himself. The rear guard was commanded by a famous warrior named Roland. While marching through the narrow pass of Ronthus among the Pyrenees, Roland's division was attacked by a tribe called the Basques, who lived on the mountain slopes of the neighboring region. High cliffs walled in the pass on either side. From the tops of these cliffs, the Basques hurled down rocks and trunks of trees upon the Franks, and crushed many of them to death. Besides this, the wild mountaineers descended into the pass and attacked them with weapons. Roland fought bravely, but at last he was overpowered, and he and all his men were killed. Roland had a friend and companion named Oliver, who was as brave as himself. Many stories and songs have been written telling of the wonderful adventures they were said to have had, and of their wonderful deeds in war. The work of Charlemagne in Spain was quickly undone for Abderrahman, the leader of the Mohammedans who had come from Damascus, soon conquered almost all the territory south of the Pyrenees. For more than forty years Charlemagne was king of the Franks, but a still greater dignity was to come to him. In the year 800 some of the people in Rome rebelled against the Pope, and Charlemagne went with an army to put down the rebellion. He entered the city with great pomp, and soon conquered the rebels. On Christmas Day he went to the church of St. Peter, and as he knelt before the altar, the Pope placed a crown upon his head, saying, Long live Charles Augustus, Emperor of the Romans. The people, assembled in the church, shouted the same words, and so Charlemagne was now Emperor of the Western Roman Empire, as well as King of the Franks, 
the emperors of Constantinople still called themselves Roman emperors, and still claimed Italy, Germany, and France as part of their empire, though really their authority had not been respected in these countries for more than three hundred years. Charlemagne built a splendid palace at Aix-la-Chapelle, a town in Germany, where perhaps he was born. Charlemagne was a tall man, with long flowing beard and of noble appearance. He dressed in very simple style, but when he went into battle he wore armor, as was the custom for kings and nobles, and often for ordinary soldiers in his day. Armor was made of leather or iron, or both together. There was a helmet of iron for the head, and a breastplate to cover the breast, or a coat of mail to cover the body. The coat of mail was made of small iron or steel rings linked together, or fastened on to a leather shirt. Coverings for the legs and feet were often attached to the coat. Part 2 Charlemagne was a great king in many other ways besides the fighting of battles. He did much good for his people. He made many excellent laws, and appointed judges to see that the laws were carried out. He established schools, and placed good teachers in charge of them. He had a school in his palace for his own children, and he employed as their teacher a very learned Englishman named Alquin. In those times few people could read or write. There were not many schools anywhere, and in most places there were none at all. Even the kings had little education. Indeed, few of them could write their own names, and most of them did not care about sending their children to school. They did not think that reading or writing was of much use, but thought that it was far better for boys to learn to be good soldiers, and for girls to learn to spin and weave. Charlemagne had a very different opinion. He was fond of learning, and whenever he heard of a learned man living in any foreign country, he tried to get him to come and live in Franklin. The fame of Charlemagne as a great warrior and a wise emperor spread all over the world. Many kings sent messengers to him to ask his friendship and bring him presents. Harun al-Rashid, the famous caliph, who lived in Baghdad in Asia, sent him an elephant and a clock which struck the hours. The Franks were much astonished at the sight of the elephant, for they had never seen one before. They also wondered much at the clock. In those days there were in Europe no clocks such as we have, but water clocks and hour glasses were used in some places. The water clock was a vessel into which water was allowed to trickle. It contained a float which pointed to a scale of hours on the side of the vessel. The float gradually rose as the water trickled in. The hour glasses measured time by the falling of fine sand from the top to the bottom of a glass vessel made with a narrow neck in the middle for the sand to go through. They were like the little glasses called egg-timers, which are used for measuring the time for boiling eggs. Charlemagne died in 814. He was buried in the church which he had built in Aix-la-Chapelle. His body was placed in the tomb, seated upon a grand chair, dressed in royal robes, with a crown on the head, a sword at the side, and a Bible in the hands. This famous emperor is known in history as Charlemagne, which is the French word for the German name Karl de Gross, Charles the Great, the name by which he was called at his own court during his life. The German name would really be a better name for him, for he was a German, and German was the language that he spoke. The common name of his favorite residence, Aix-la-Chapelle, also is French, but he knew the place as Aachen. The great empire which Charlemagne built up held together only during the life of his son. Then it was divided among his three grandsons. Louis took the eastern part, Lothair took the central part, with the title of emperor, and Charles took the western part. End of chapter 11《ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャルズ・ハッピーバーチャ
Chapter 12 Harun al-Rashid Caliph from 789 to 809 A.D. 1. The most celebrated of all Mohammedan caliphs was Harun al-Rashid, which means, in English, Aaron the Just. Harun is also the hero of several of the stories of the Arabian Nights, a famous book which perhaps you have read. There are many curious and wonderful tales in it. When Harun was only eighteen years old, he showed such courage and skill as a soldier that his father, who was then caliph, allowed him to lead an army against the enemies of the Mohammedans, and he won many great victories. He afterwards commanded an army of ninety-five thousand Arabs and Persians sent by his father to invade the Eastern Roman Empire, which was then ruled by the Empress Irene. After defeating Irene's famous general Nicetas, Harun marched his army to Chrysopolis, now Scutari, on the Asiatic coast, opposite Constantinople. He encamped on the heights, in full view of the Roman capital. The empress saw that the city would certainly be taken by the Muslims. She therefore sent ambassadors to Harun to arrange terms, but he sternly refused to agree to anything except immediate surrender. Then one of the ambassadors said, The empress has heard much of your ability as a general. Though you are her enemy, she admires you as a soldier. These flattering words were pleasing to Harun. He walked to and fro in front of his tent, and then spoke again to the ambassadors. Tell the empress, he said, that I will spare Constantinople if she will pay me seventy thousand pieces of gold as a yearly tribute. If the tribute be regularly paid, Constantinople shall not be harmed by any Muslim force. The empress had to agree to these terms. She paid the first year's tribute, and soon the great Muslim army set out on its homeward march. When Harun was not quite twenty-one years old, he became the caliph. He began his reign by appointing very able ministers, who carried on the work of the government so well that they greatly improved the condition of the people. Harun built a palace in Baghdad, far grander and more beautiful than that of any caliph before him. Here he established his court, and lived in great splendor, attended by hundreds of courtiers and slaves. He was very anxious that his people should be treated justly by the officers of the government, and he was determined to find out whether any had reason to complain, so he sometimes disguised himself at night, and went all through the streets and bazaars, listening to the talk of those whom he had met, and asking them questions. In this way he learned whether the people were contented and happy, or not. In those times Baghdad in the east, and the Mohammedan cities of Spain in the west, were famed for their schools and learned men. Arabian teachers first introduced into Western Europe both algebra and the figures which we use in arithmetic. It is for this reason that we call these figures the Arabic numerals. Harun al-Rashid gave great encouragement to learning. He was a scholar and poet himself, and whenever he heard of learned men in his own kingdom or in neighboring countries, he invited them to his court and treated them with respect. The name of Harun, therefore, became known throughout the world. It is said that a correspondence took place between him and Charlemagne, and that, as you have learned, Harun sent the great emperor a present of a clock and an elephant. The tribute of gold that the Empress Irene agreed to pay Harun was sent regularly for many years. It was always received at Baghdad with great ceremony. The day on which it arrived was made a holiday. The Roman soldiers who came with it entered the gates in procession. Muslim troops also took part in the parade. When the gold had been delivered at the palace, the Roman soldiers were hospitably entertained and were escorted to the main gate of the city when they set out on their journey back to Constantinople. 2. In 802, Nicephorus usurped the throne of the Eastern Empire. He sent ambassadors with a letter to Harun to tell him that the tribute would no longer be paid. The letter contained these words. The weak and faint-hearted Irene submitted to pay you tribute. She ought to have made you pay tribute to her. Return to me all that she paid you, else the matter must be settled by the sword. As soon as Harun had read these words, the ambassadors threw a bundle of swords at his feet. The caliph smiled, and drawing his own sword, or scimitar, he cut the Roman swords in two with one stroke without injuring the blade or even turning the edge of his weapon. Then he dictated a letter to Nicephorus, in which he said, Harun al-Rashid, commander of the faithful, to Nicephorus, the Roman dog, I have read thy letter, thou shalt not hear, thou shalt see my reply. Harun was as good as his word. He started that day with a large army to punish the emperor. As soon as he reached Roman territory, he ravaged the country, and took possession of everything valuable that he found. He laid siege to Heraclea, a city on the shores of the Black Sea, and in a week forced it to surrender. Then he sacked the place. 
Nicephorus was now forced to agree to pay the tribute. Scarcely, however, had the caliph reached his palace in Baghdad when the emperor again refused to pay. Harun, consequently, advanced into the Roman province of Phrygia, in Asia Minor, with an army of 15,000 men. Nicephorus marched against him with 125,000 men. In the battle which followed, the emperor was wounded, and 40,000 of his men were killed. After this defeat, Nicephorus again promised payment of the tribute, but again failed to keep his promise. Harun now vowed that he would kill the emperor if he should ever lay hands upon him. But as he was getting ready to march once more into the Roman provinces, a revolt broke out in one of the cities of his own kingdom, and while on his way to suppress it, the great caliph died of an illness which had long given him trouble. End of chapter 12 Recorded by Halleck Datesman, Brooklyn, New York